Hello and welcome to part one on our lecture series on the scientific revolution here on Learning the Social Sciences. So just a little bit of information when we are jumping into the scientific revolution. Back during the actual scientific revolution, science as a word did not really exist. If you were a scientist, you were a natural philosopher and science was referred to as natural philosophy. So whenever you're reading a primary document, keep this in mind because scientist is not officially coined until the 1830s. Now the scientific revolution is starting really with the old Greek and ancient and classical world science. It has been rejuvenated in Europe and a lot of people are looking at Aristotleism and looking at the works of Ptolemy and now thinking how in the world does the system and the world operate and new theories are going to be coming out. However, the scientific revolution does not start all at once, nor does it begin at any specific set date. There's not like a book that was published specifically and we say, boom, this is when it starts. Now, a lot of people do refer to Nicholas Copernicus's book. However, what about all the work da Vinci did? What about other work that is going on before that? So like the Renaissance, the scientific revolution does not have an official start date, but it does have some big names. Like I've already mentioned, Copernicus, we've got Galileo, Francis Bacon, Sir Isaac Newton. So we have a lot of people that are going to be bringing in new ideas, new thoughts, new theories, and new laws to the scientific community. So something else to consider as we look at the scientific revolution is epistemology. What in the world is epistemology? It's the study or a theory of the nature and grounds of knowledge, especially with reference to its limits and validity. And so as we are going to be going through all of the information over this PowerPoint, we are going to be seeing some transformations going on as we are going to look at the study and the theories of nature. Let's jump in and talk about the Aristotle and universe. Aristotle's theories were brought back into Europe in the 12th and 13th century. Now it has not disappeared from the planet, you know, the Middle East and other locations, Eastern Europe, they have not lost it. They have continued to study the works of Aristotle and the other greats from the classical world. But Western Europe is now once again finding them after the early Middle Ages. <clears throat> and so with this, we are starting to look at Ptolemy, Aristotle, Plato, but mostly we're looking at empirical thought. We're looking at the steps that they took to make their predictions or their theories. And so with empirical thought, we have first, you're going to think about, well, whatever you're thinking about. If you're thinking about, say, is the earth the center of the universe or the sun? So you are going to think about it in a more logical way. Then you're going to observe it, make your observations and you're probably going to write some things down, maybe draw some charts. And then number three, you're going to derive principles from one and two. Now we're thinking about a time period though, like where they don't have a telescope. So this is kind of their limited ability that they have. Now, early Aristotelians in Western Europe were actually burned as heretics until it started to catch on and then we're going to have some people who go against Aristotelianism in the future, but still the past for us, um, that are going to be burnt at the stake. And we are going to have the conflict about, for example, heliocentric or geocentric theory. Anyway, we are going to have the church get involved. Now, one thing that I need you to understand right away is the church is the number one patron of the scientific revolution. What? The church? Yes. The church gives the most money to the people to be able to come out with these scientific discoveries. However, we are going to have some conflicts with some of these discoveries, which we'll be talking about in a later video. 
Now, the Aristotelian universe uh, is one that is geocentric, which means the Earth is the center of the universe, and the sun is going to circle around the Earth. They also believe that there is like a layer, a sphere, where the stars are also held. And so if you go and you chart it out, you would have the Earth, then you would have the Moon, Mercury, Venus, the Sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and then that's basically as far as they can see with their naked eye. And then we would have the sphere of those kind of fixed stars uh, coming in after that. Now the Ptolemaic universe is slightly different. Um, we have ideas about uniform circular motion and epicycles were cataloged by Ptolemy. So we do have more rotation, more movement of the planets. However, we still have the Earth in the center. It is still a geocentric theory. Now, in terms of science and the views of it in the Middle Ages, a lot of Europeans believed that the center of all truth and experience was in God, and that the concern with material phenomenon was a serious neglect of one's soul and one's dependence on God. And there was a, just a distrust in human perception because it can be wrong. I mean, if you know a magician and have seen a magic trick, well, what is that? It's your perception being fooled. And so they say, hey, man, we can be fooled with this. So human perception was untrustworthy. The material world itself was deceptive. Now, rather than a vehicle for truth, the material world was put in place to actively distract humans from the real task. And for Western Europe, the real task is living a life that is going to get you into heaven. Now, if we think of the early Middle Ages, what is the one thing that was constant from the fall of Rome all the way through to the rebirth of Europe with the Renaissance? Well, we had cover governments come and go. We had mass migrations with the Germanic migrations. We had um, the Vikings come, the Carolingian Renaissance. We've had a lot of events happen. But the one thing that was there throughout is the Christian church. Specifically in Western Europe, the Catholic Church, after the split, the schism has happened. And so this is the one thing that people are focused on. Now, when we look at the causes for the scientific revolution, uh, we have to look to those medieval intellectual scholars and the universities that are actually coming out. The Dark Ages are not as dark as one would actually think and expect. We do have intellectual life. Remember, I already just mentioned the Carolingian Renaissance of Charlemagne. There is that glimmer of light. Then we also have the 1200s where we start to really see life come back up. However, we do have, unfortunately, the Black Death, which you know, puts things on reverse for a little bit in the 1300s. However, the Italian Renaissance is going to bring everything back into motion. And we're going to see, besides the renew renewed emphasis on the arts and writing, we are going to see people jump back into mathematics, into the sciences. And the Renaissance is going to create a system of patronage that is really going to help the scientists of the scientific revolution. Another area that is going to help is the age of exploration. We are going to need those navigational problems and those long sea voyage problems with ships fixed. So if you can figure out a great telescope that can help with that, if you can figure out anything that can help with navigation, boom, we will pay you big bucks to be able to have those items. And so better scientific instruments are going to come out so that the European ships can keep on going. Now, of course, as I've already mentioned, one of the big early people in the scientific revolution is going to be Nicholas Copernicus. He is a Polish priest, yes, a member of the church, an astronomer who has lived in various locations in Europe and is a very well-studied individual. And he is going to publish uh, on the revolutions of the heavenly spheres. With this book, he is going to propose a heliocentric theory, a sun-centered universe over a geocentric theory. Now, this is going to challenge the Ptolemaic and the Aristotelian model uh, that has been really used since antiquity um, on and off, and depending where you are. We already talked about how it was reintroduced and some of the conflict there. 
Now he is seeing Copernicus is seen as a natural philosopher. He is seen as somebody who has done his work and some people read it and they're like, yeah, that could be. And other people are adamantly opposed to it. Um, so we will be talking about those individuals here in our next lecture that support what Copernicus writes and those that are opposed to it. Now, Copernicus himself said that the sun not only symbolized kind of God, but it also contained God. And so it should be at the center. So even he himself, with looking and taking a scientific approach to his model, he is still touching on that religious aspect uh, within his text. And he said that this heliocentric theory offered a better spiritual explanation of the universe. And he said that the Earth was really no different than any other planet within the solar system, except for the fact that it has life. But he's just talking about, you know, the actual placement. Anyway, the Copernican system at the time period when it was published was no more accurate than the, than the Ptolemaic because it hadn't been proved mathematically and with a whole bunch of other things. What we're going to be going through with the PowerPoint. Either way, he has created now this great debate in Europe that is going to be going on now for a while as different natural philosophers are going to try to prove or disprove his theory. So this has been episode one on our lecture series on the scientific revolution. Thank you very much for listening. Remember to like and subscribe and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.